You really don't know I'm a Christmas side of this. Yeah, live children, yeah. Oh, no. Reaching out to live children. Yeah. My back in life, children live right. Don't fight, don't fight. Oh, no, no, back on you now. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello to all of my friends all across the world, wherever you might be today. Today, I'm bringing you another Dr. Ari Connor meeting, um, a candid conversation um, with the uh, attorneys um, across the diaspora on the um, topic of reparations. Now, for my personal friends who know me, you guys know that I've followed the topic of reparations for quite a while now. Um, let me just say good afternoon to everyone who's watching. Thank you guys for um, tuning into the show today. Um, I am going to go straight into the um, into the sharing of the screen and um, the meeting. It is just about to start, guys. Um, so thank you guys very much for tuning in. Be sure to um, send me... Uh, hit the video a uh, thumbs up, uh, drop me a comment. Uh, hello to you, princess out there. Um, everyone else, be sure to drop me a comment. If you're watching on Facebook, your comments won't get to me. So I strongly recommend that you go and hit the link in the description and come watch it on YouTube. And if you've not done so already, please be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Guys, I have some excited news about my YouTube channel um, that I'm going to be making a video about um, how to cook and inspire out there as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, guys, we're going to go into this candid conversation with Dr. Arikana and the um, lawyers throughout the diaspora on the topic of reparations. Let me just get my screen up and we're going to start in just okay. a moment. Again, sorry about that, guys. Just bear with me. Um, we also need to get the stream on Instagram as well. Okay, very good. I don't see the Alright, so we need to get the stream up on Instagram as well, so just bear with me just one moment. Let me just get Instagram um, up and running. Okay guys, so this meeting is going to get going in just a moment. Hello, hello, hello. What's up now? And we're good to go? Yes, ma'am. All right, guys, we are good to great, go. Great, so good let's go. Um, Hi, Mary, to you. Distinguished um, guests, um, panelists, um, excellencies, and, and members of the um, African um, diaspora. I want to say welcome to um, our first, our very first event on reparation for African descendants and exploring models for redress. Um, uh, I think this is a conversation that is critical for um, our community, community uh, because the injustice that has been done to 
a bit of asking to say all of the world um, obviously has um, lasting impact. Um, and for us to achieve true liberation, I think there's a, um, there's an economic element, right? Economic um, justice um, is, is imperative. Um, as we as we move forward and for our community to continue to, to elevate. So um, the ABDI is, is honored um, to take the lead on this initiative. And we know there are countless um, folks out there who are working on somewhat similar initiatives. And we ask that you join us um, on making um, this concept a reality. And, and later on, we'll provide more information about uh, what exactly the ABDI is doing outside of this first outside of this first conference um, so that we can get you, you more engaged. Uh, but for the sake of time, um, I would like to, to introduce our ambassador, Her Excellency Elihana Chemboli Kwao, uh, who is the president and chief executive officer of um, the African Diaspora Development Institute. Um, Her Excellency is a medical doctor by, by profession. Um, she has practiced uh, medicine for over 25 years. Um, she's the founder and owner of medical clinics. Um, um, she's a diplomat, uh, public speaker, an educator, and also an entrepreneur. She's also the author of a recently published book, Africa 101. The Wicca Call is a bestseller on Amazon, so be sure to grab a copy when you have a chance. And, and many of us um, became familiar with Her Excellency um, in her previous role as um, the permanent representative to the African Union Mission here in Washington, D.C. from 2016 to 2019. Um, she certainly um, um, inspired so many of us, um, including myself, from the African diaspora to get engaged about issues impacting us here in America and in Europe in the Caribbean, on the African continent. So wherever you are, um, she's inspired us uh, to get more engaged um, and, and to come to come together to find um, some of some of the solutions, some of the most critical challenges impacting our our our, our communities. Um, so during her three year tenure as the AU ambassador to the US, her excellency received over one hundred awards and attestations from many organizations, including from the African diaspora within the Americas. She received um, the 2018 Ambassador of the Year from Howard University in DC, HU. I know there are some Howard uh, folks in the building today. Um, she also received numerous recognitions from members of Congress, as well as governors, mayors, and county executives from across the US, as well as the Caribbean and the South America. Um, you can visit our, our website, um, the ADBI, to learn more about um, this phenomenal woman, uh, this power house woman that we call our, our our leader within this organization and a leader in the African diaspora uh, in general. So um, I, I'm, I'm not going to say much more about her because there's so much. I could be here and I could talk forever about some of her accomplishments of African. So now I would like to pass um, the microphone over, the virtual mic microphone over to Her Excellency to address everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my daughter, Dorna. Uh, the distinguished lawyers on the uh, on panel today, uh, to Mayor Crum, to uh, our more Thank you for coming to attend this very important webinar. We are calling on all of you to come and address an issue that should have been addressed a long time ago. Many other nationalities, races, that have been subjected to some of the most gruesome abuses that could ever be meted to any human being have been given reparations, including the Japanese who bombed Pearl Harbor, even they have received their reparations. As black people, on the other hand, in spite 
of having endured over 400 years of abuse and some of the abuse that continues to go on today. Us as black people who have built the Western nations and continue to provide massive workforce for the continued building of the Western nations are yet to be recognized and be appreciated and to be compensated for some of the most horrible abuses that could have been limited to any human being. Abuses that are so unimaginable that you sit back and you say, those who perpetrated those abuses and they continue to perpetrate them to this day, how do they go to sleep at night and work hard every day feeling good about themselves? I'm talking about what happened to the slaves, what happened to African children of Africa as they were transported along across the Atlantic to the Americas? What continued to happen to them on the plantations? The lynchings, the lynchings that continue to this day, even though they have taken a different form. They're just now just leaning, kneeling on our necks. We talk about the abuses that were perpetrated against Africans, the genocide that were ordered against many ethnic groups in Africa, from, from Namibia by the Germans, to the UK, to, to, uh, to Kenya by the British, uh, to, to all the atrocities committed by the French, all over the continent. To this day, they took scouts of Africans to Europe to study them, to see if they were really human, to, to use them for decoration as a trophy for having chopped off the head of an African. The scouts are still littering. European museums to this day. Museums that are making a lot of money out of sheer enjoyment of looking at the skulls of the behaved Africans and looking at the evidence of murder being displayed by those who never paid for the crimes that they committed. To this day, they are fighting the black people who are simply asking on the remains of our ancestors so we could give them proper burial. Wow. This is 2020. I guess it's because it's black people and our lives. We're here to talk about why something must be done. We're here to let the world know that no more shall children of Africa continue to take a back seat while the abuses continue. The abuses are so related. Anywhere else where such abuses are going to be meted to a people, it would be a reason for all our war. But I guess when these abuses are being meted to black people, it doesn't matter for our lives. Do not matter. The conversation here today is realizing that we have lots of friends around the world. People who may not look like you and I, but they understand that what's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. That when we continue to abuse one particular race, we are abusing the whole humanity. That we have a responsibility to make this world a better place, a fair place, a just place, and a righteous place for all of us, regardless of our skin color, to live together in harmony. We demand that as black people, we must be accepted and appreciated as equals on this earth. In fact, if the truth be told, as a black man, as a black woman, you are the mother and father of humanity. They went to Europe looking for origins of humanity they couldn't find. They went to China. They went all over the world, except Africa, looking for origins of humanity. It wasn't until they came to Africa that they found the origin of humanity. They did. It was not the Africans. But the proof is in the Black people, and the origins of humanity. Black people are the mothers and fathers of humanity. As such, we should be revered. We should be held at the tallest pedestal and be appreciated for what we have done 
for this world. But instead, the world has sent out a special call. The world has sent out a memo that wherever you are, if you are not black, and you encounter black people, you have the right to disrespect them. And so it is. We are the scum of the earth. I often say, the most endangered species on earth is a black man, worse than the wild animals in the jungle. And right next to him is the black woman. The question I have now is that with what I know, black people are some of the most intelligent and most hardworking people I know. Why is it then that we have failed to push back against these abuses? Why is it then we have failed to simply speak our truth? What we are asking for is nothing short of what they would ask for. We are asking for the creation of the world that is just, that is fair, and that is right. And that as black people, we only want what is due to us. Reparations of black people are way past due, and we're here to begin the conversation that says the issue pertaining to reparations for black people is an issue that we must look at from a global point of view. It is not an issue that can be dealt with a small group of people in some part of the United States, small group of people in some part of the Caribbean, small group of people in some part of South America or Europe. It is an issue that we black people must deal with as one united front. The abuse of black people started on the continent of Africa. For us to tell this conversation, where this conversation needs to go, we must go to Africa to the beginning. And united speaking with one voice, we can move from the valley to the mountain top. But that mission can only be accomplished when we come together, united as children of one mother Africa, and send a strong message, resoundingly to the world, that no more shall we continue to be abused. For the children of Africa around the globe are saying, enough is enough. Welcome to the conference, and I'm looking forward for some serious deliberations Deliberations that will move the needle to the next level of this conversation, a conversation that must put an end to the suffering of black people, a conversation that is going to compensate black people and put us on a path that we can catch up with the rest of the world when it comes to economic liberation. So there is where they defeated us and they continue to defeat us until we are truly economically liberated. Benjamin L. Crump is the principal of Ben Crump Law, a Washington, D.C. based firm and founder of the Ben Crump Social Justice Institute, headquartered at Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. Overcoming very humble beginnings in rural North Carolina, Mr. Crump has quickly become one of the most recognizable and successful lawyers in America. He has provided legal representation and recovered millions of dollars for his clients in some of the most high profile cases in the United States. In January 2006, Crump relentlessly pursued justice on behalf of the parents of Martin Lee Anderson, the 14-year-old who died the day after he was restrained and beaten and suffocated at the Bay County Juvenile Boot Camp. This was the largest claims bill for an individual in a wrongful death case ever approved by the state of Florida. Crump recently achieved a very critical victory as lead attorney on what had been characterized as the landmark voters' rights case of this millennium when nine African-American women were arrested with guns drawn for alleged voter fraud in Madison, Florida. Crump again led the fight for justice as the lead attorney for the family of Trayvon Martin, who was killed by a neighborhood watch volunteer in Sanford, Florida. 
Trump's representation of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, led President Obama to call on U.S. Congress to pass legislation for police body camera videos. He served as the attorney for 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio, Alicia Thomas in Los Angeles, California, Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Antonio Zorano Montez in Pasco, Washington, who were all killed by police, captured on video. He also sought justice for J.D. Lincoln, and nine other victims in the police rape case of 13 black women in Oklahoma City. And Robbie told him in the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case where a professional baseball player was shot in front of his house in a predominantly white neighborhood. Attorney Crump is a benefactor and mentor to me. As board chairman of the legal services of North Florida, Attorney Crump and his partner donated $1 million to the organization's capital campaign to ensure that poor people would continue to have quality legal representation and access to Mr. Crump was appointed the first board chairman of Florida's Big Bend Fair Housing Center Incorporated, a federal grant organization dedicated to the eradication of housing discrimination. Attorney Crump believes in fighting to preserve the justice that minorities have achieved throughout the civil rights era, and has served as the 73rd president of the National Bar Association, as general counsel to the Florida chapter of the NAACP, and as president of the National Civil Rights Trial Lawyers Association. He was the first African-American to serve as president of the Federal Bar Association for Florida's Northern District. He was named the National Trial Lawyer's Top 100 Lawyers in America, Ebony Magazine Top 100 Most Influential African-Americans, and the National Newspaper Publisher Association's Newsmaker of the Year. He stole the SCLC Martin Luther King Servant Leadership Award, the NAACP Thurgood Marshall Award, and the National Civil Rights Museum Freedom Award. Crump is a life member of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the NAACP, and the National Urban League. Over the years, Mr. Crump has dedicated his areas of practice in civil rights, employment, personal injury, wrongful death cases, and class actions. Crump is executive producer of the groundbreaking documentary Woman in Motion about Michelle Nichols and the race to space. Nick was among the first African-American actresses on TV and played Lieutenant Aurora on Star Trek, the original series. He hosts the television series Evidence of Innocence about wrongfully incarcerated individuals exonerated by DNA evidence. Is host of the a and &E documentary series Search for Justice and is author of the book Open Season, an insightful account of D. Benjamin Crump is a committed family man and he believes the value of his family is critical to his success. Man's life should be defined by the impact he made in the lives of his fellow human beings. What impact are you making? Benjamin L. Crump. Thank you, thank you. Before um, um, Council Crump um, gets um, starts to deliver the keynote speech, I would like to say um, the, the last quote that we saw, uh, what kind of impact are, are you making in, in, in this world? And I can tell you this, before uh, Attorney Trump became um, international known, should I say, um, uh, Natala Hassi, uh, we knew him as our hero. And I remember um, as a student at Florida and University, everybody who wanted to become a lawyer would go to Crump and his former partner um, for advice, for guidance. Um, he was always welcoming. Um, he would write recommendation letters to, to individuals. Um, to attend law school, and his law firm was kind of like the home of people in the community. He would host um, Christmas parties, all sorts of holiday parties, and just ex exposed um, um, the entire community to the firm and, and treated everyone um, as if they mattered, right? So so, uh, so as we're this, having this discussion on, on reparations, uh, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's critical because I think those of us who have the intellectual capacity, who have been given the privilege to serve in, in certain roles, we have a duty and obligation to liberate our brothers and sisters through the knowledge that we have gained. Um, it, it, it's our our, our our duty that that has been bestowed upon us by by a much higher higher power. Um, so I can tell you, um, Benjamin Trump, he actually lives on what he says. He actually wrote my recommendation letter to law school um, and so forth. Um, but um, today's discussion for attorney attorney Trump would be around um, a, a historic a reparations case against um, Harvard University on behalf of, of his clients, uh, which have lineage, who, who are a uh, lingual of, of descendants of, of Africa. Um, the, the case is currently in the Massachusetts Superior Court. 
Um, and if he wins, which I'm, I'm sure he would win, because these days, um, 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 counsel Krupp um, wins cases left and right. Uh, and, um, and and also congratulations um, to your recent um, to your re recent victory. Um, so if he wins, it will be the very first time um, that a lineage of African slave has ever recovered anything from an American institution. That is huge. Um, so uh, please um, welcome um, Benjamin Trump um, as he delivers um, the key um, notes speech today. Thank you so very much, Attorney LeBlanc, for that very, very uh, personal introduction. It's very special to me. I am so very proud of your maturation, not only in the legal profession, but your influence on the African diaspora. You are our future, and our future is bright. Um, to <laughs> Madam Ambassador, what powerful words. I am inspired and have renewed commitment upon hearing your call to action, and we receive that. To the African Diaspora Developmental Institute, I am very honored to be here with you this afternoon for this important conversation. Uh, to my good friends and colleagues at Howard University, uh, I am always grateful for your um, so aristocracy of intellect to share with our brothers who are, and sisters who are less fortunate to be able to get a post-secondary education. As Attorney LeBanc said, it is our duty to make sure that education is of value. And as the old Chinese proverb says, education means nothing if you keep it amongst the educated. We have to share it with our uh, masses of our people. I will speak to you briefly in my time about a historic case as Attorney LeBlanc uh, discussed. And I am fortunate to have Miss Tamara Lanier, who is my client and her family in suing Harvard University in this landmark reparations case. So with that, I will begin uh, to hopefully uh, introduce you all to Papa Renzi. And for those of you who are on the forefront of this issue of reparations and have read the New York Times and CNN articles on Papa Renzi, allow me to give you even more in-depth knowledge of why this case is so landmark. I, along with my co-counsel, Attorney Joshua Koskov, uh, and this is the actual argument I made before the Massachusetts Superior Court. We represent Tamara Lanier, who made a promise to her mother on her deathbed that she would let her family and the world know that her great-great-great-grandfather, Renty, was not who they professed him to be. That the African slave who was named Renty was not ignorant, illiterate, worthless or anonymous and was not irrelevant he was a deserved respect consideration humanity and dignity and that he mattered your honor we come before this court to ask you that you do not condone harvard's intellectual justification of discrimination i have made arguments against the intellectual justification of discrimination in courtrooms all across America, representing the families of Trayvon Martin. The whose names have become rallying cries for Black Lives Matter. However, all this attempt before this court today in engaging in the intellectual justification of discrimination is more pronounced than any other case I have ever seen. They are condoning the scientific racism that has not only perpetuated the institution of slavery in America, but was used as the basis for, used as a basis 
for the Holocaust in Germany and apartheid in South Africa. They are complicit in their racism. They are not overtly, overtly coming before this court to say that they condone the intolerable Louis Agassiz's methods and practices. They are putting forth subtle legal technicalities like statute of limitations have passed for Ms. Lanier and that she does not have a constitutional claim. But what they are doing is engaging in an extreme case of intellectual justification of discrimination. Through the illegal actions of the past, Harvard continues to benefit from the spoils of slavery and continue to deny Ms. Lanier her rightful property. Despite their best efforts to convince this court otherwise, Harvard cannot separate these images from the illegal nature of their creation. When the images of proper renting were taken, and these images are daguerreotypes, some of the earliest known photographs that exist in the world today, and the earliest photographs of African slaves that exist in America. When the images of Papa Renty were taken, it is easy to see how Harvard could feel the images were justified. But that was more than 150 years ago. Have they learned nothing since? Have they not learned the difference between right and wrong as society progressed from a time that made the legal, made legal the enslavement of a man based on the color of his skin? Or Aren't we now living in a time where equality and justice are supposed to reign supreme? At the 2017 Universities in Slavery Bound by History Conference, Harvard claimed it wanted to come to terms with its slave field past. The institution said this even as Papa Renty's piercing gaze was prominently displayed on a jumbotron screen as part of the conference's theme. Melissa Banta from Harvard's Peabody Museum used the same image of naked paparenti for the cover of the 30th anniversary edition of her book published in 2016 from Sight, S-I-T-E, to Sight, S-I-G-H-T. Anthropology, photography, and the power of imagery. Has Harvard lost sight of its morals? Does the institution as a whole not see the hypocrisy and the irony of its continued use of Papa Renzi's image and the lie they proclaimed when they said they wanted to come to terms with its slave field past? By defending the current use of the images, Harvard effectively defends the method by which it was taken and the system that allowed it to happen, the enslavement of African human beings and millions of their descendants. With all due respect, Harvard speaks with forked tongue when it says that it does not condone slavery or Professor Louis Agassiz's racist teachings. Their actions speak much louder than their words. No matter how awful they claim they craft their arguments or they, how hard they try to cling to legal technicalities, the undeniable truth remains that Harvard's goal in continuing to benefit from the spoils of slavery and Agassiz's scientific racism. Your Honor, you do not have to take my word for it. I want you to hear Agassiz's own words. This is a letter from Louis Agassiz to his mother from America. It is impossible for me to reprocess the feeling that they are not of the same blood as us. Your Honor, he is referring to the idea that black people do not share the same genetics as white people. And seeing their black faces 
with their thick lips and their grimacing teeth, the wool of their head, the bent of their knee, their elongated hands, the curved nails, and especially the livid color of the palm of their hands. I could not take my eyes off their face in order to tell them to stay far away. And when they advanced to that hated, hideous hand towards my plate in order to serve me, I wish I was able to depart in order to serve, I'm sorry, in order to eat a piece of bread elsewhere rather than, rather than to dine with such. What unhappiness for the white race to have their existence so closely with that of Negroes in certain countries. God preserved us from such contact. Those were the words of Harvard's Professor Lewis Agassiz in 1849. What about the unhappiness of the black race or the Negroid type? as Louis Agassiz called us, being inflicted into human bondage and having to suffer the cruelty of slavery, the act of comparing mere unhappiness to what we endured as a people is the ultimate insult. My ancestors were ripped from their home and their homeland, sold into slavery, dragged in chains across the ocean and forced to work while being beaten, raped, tortured, right up to the moment they died. And they died knowing that their children were doomed to suffer the same fate as them. Your Honor, we are here to make a wrong right. In concert with Attorney Koskoff, when he put before this court, we are here to protect Ms. Lanier's constitutional rights and provide her an equitable remedy under law, and I do so with these three points. Equitable restitution, constitutional law claims, and a prima facie tort claim. I won't get into the details of those arguments for the sake of brevity, but I will then go to what I believe is the crux of the argument. I do want to point out one thing that I think is important. Equitable restitution. The laws of equity do not allow one person to become unjustly enriched at the expense of another. Harvard has to mirror the nearest property. And Tammy isn't saying she owns these multi-million dollar pictures just because the subjects are her ancestors, but because the nature of the pictures creation. These images were taken under duress. This was not just simple duress. This was the most severe duress. Let's imagine the duress of Renty and his daughter Delia when these photographs were taken. Let's consider the consequences if they challenge their slave masters and refuse to obey their master's will, like Tam Tamara Lanier, their lineal descendant, their great 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 granddaughter, is challenging Harvard's Board of Overseers today in this courtroom. What would have happened to the Renty and Delia? They would have been beaten, they would have been starved. They would have been tortured to death. Put simply, it is clear beyond any doubt that Renty and Delia would have never been given an option to leave. They were forced to strip naked for God knows how long in front of strange white people, and they were photographed, and measurements were taken of Delia's breasts waist, buttocks, and lips. And they measured her father Renty's shoulders, arms, lips, nose, and his penis. That is the nature 
of which these pictures were created at Harvard's direction and at Renty's expense and at Delia's expense and at the expense of Renty's linear descendants and at the expense of every linear descendant of slavery in America. Equity asks, is this fair? Is this just? Is this conscionable? Equitable restitution restores what ought to be, regardless of what has been. And so understand that these pictures were taken to give visual evidence of Louis Agassiz's racist theories that blacks were inferior to whites. He wanted to find an original African slave because remember, in 1812, America had outlawed the importation of slaves. And so the only slaves that were being produced were being produced by rape and misogyny of black women by slave masters or forcing blacks to get together and procreate. He wanted to try to find a pure African, as he termed it. And he went down to... Columbia, South Carolina, and they found Renty, who was referred to as the African. And Miss Lanier often wondered why they called her grandfather the African, saying we are all of them African. But it was because he was of pure African blood. And once Louis Agassiz found him, he said that we are going to export him and take pictures of their body. And those pictures still exist today in Harvard's Peabody Museum, and they are of great value. And what Miss Lanier is saying is we deserve our family photos back. You see, when we were freed in 1854, even though we had no uh, rights to own anything, we didn't have a right to any contracts, any land, anything. We didn't have our 40 acres off the mule. But what we thought we at least we had the right to was our own image. But Harvard says, no, Miss Lanier, you don't have a right to your own image. Renty, you still don't have a right to your own image 160 years later. So in conclusion, it is no secret that Harvard relies on legal technicalities. This is by necessity. There is no moral or equitable defense to Harvard's continued profiting from slavery more than 150 years after it ended. We are imploring this court not to participate in Harvard's enterprise of profiting from crimes against humanity. We are asking this court not to allow Harvard to continue its intellectual justification of discrimination. If Harvard prevails, let them prove to a jury of our peers that they should be entitled to profit from the suffering of millions of black Americans. Let them prove to, it, a, to a jury of our peers that they should continue to profit from the monstrous crimes of Lewis Agassiz, this race scientist. Let them prove it to a jury of our peers that they should be unjustly enriched by their participation in white supremacy. Your Honor, this court has the power to make an instrument for good, not to be used as a weapon by to oppress by the enemies of equality. This is a landmark case. This Miss Lanier is granted an opportunity. This could be the first time in the history that an American institution has been required to make a lineal descendant of an African slave whole according to the American system of justice. It is important to the entire American society. It is important, especially for the descendants of African slaves. But it is most important to Miss the
Sarah Lanier, who made her mother a promise on her deathbed that she would let the world know that her papa Renty life mattered. In essence, black lives matter. Harvard proclaimed that they didn't matter in 1850, but today, Tamara Lanier proclaims Papa Renty life matters and that black lives matter. And that was the conclusion of our argument. And I will say this, Harvard offered, you're talking about insult to injury, our Harvard offered that the daguerreotypes should stay in their Peabody Museum so they could be used as an educational tool and they can teach people about the horrors of slavery. To which Ms. Lanier, who is not a lawyer, who is a wonderful, strong black woman, made the best legal argument I have ever heard in rebutting Harvard's suggestion. She said, that would be like letting Germany, the German soldiers and their lineal descendants teach the Jewish community about the Holocaust. Why is it that they think that their story, their narrative, and their version of history should reign supreme against black people and the descendants from Africa. This case is landmark on so many levels. And as Madam Ambassador said, our ancestry and our art should be in museums that we control the narrative. So I ask for your continued vigilance and prayers for Ms. Tamara Lanier, this very strong black woman to be able to deliver on the promise that she made to her mother on her deathbed because it will benefit all children of Africa. Thank you, Attorney LeBlanc. Thank you to the African Diaspora Developmental Institute. This is one of the most important conversations we could be having in the world today. And I'm so very honored to be present to be with you. And thank you, Mr. Marilyn Neal. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, counsel. Um, I, I think we could have a whole conference just on this litigation alone. But before yeah. we move on to our distinguished uh, panel discussion, I was wondering, is it too late for the APBI to submit an amicus brief? I, I don't think so. Uh, we will welcome it. Um, but I, we do think we will get a ruling on their motion to dismiss before the end of uh, December. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate your time and your work. We know at the ADB, yeah, we can't afford you. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak with, with the public and to uh, share some of the amazing work that you are doing on behalf of people of African descent, not just here in America, but all over the world. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to joining you and Professor Justin Hansford and being a member of the ADB. PDI. Absolutely, we'd love to have you. Uh, we, um, so, so now we will, we will transition over to our distinguished uh, panel discussion. Um, our panel is comprised of um, some of the best and brightest legal minds um, from all the world. We have folks from Canada, from here in the United States, uh, from the Caribbean. Um, and just before um, I introduce our distinguished uh, moderator, uh, attorney Gary Blesso, I want to say that our ADBI legal team is, is led by um, Damian Benjamin. He is the mastermind behind all of this. Um, so if you would like to join um, the ADBI legal team, please reach out to us and we'll get you connected. Um, so as it relates to Mr. Um, Gary Blesso, um, he is the former acting dean of um, the Thurgood Marshall School of Law located in, in, uh, in Texas, in Houston, Texas. Um, he currently serves as the president 
of the Texas NAACP and has held that position since being elected in 1991. So you cannot serve in such role unless you are about the business of the people, in particular, people of African descent. So he's a real one. Um, the Austin lawyer who specializes in public interest law, employment law, and civil rights law has a long-standing relationship with the NAACP as a member and its national board since 2003. Um, Dean, well, Attorney Blesso has uh, won numerous cases uh, throughout his legal career, uh, and he's, he's also uh, negotiated an African American Student Scholarship Program with the HP, which provides $25,000 in scholarships for students attending the Texas Southern University, Prairie View a and University, and Houston Tilton University. Uh, Betzel's legal acumen has earned him an Avery rating according to a prestigious legal publication of the Martindale Pupil, the second highest rating available for lawyers. That is critical. Uh, Bledsoe has received several Lawyers of the Year Award from the Texas Attorney General and the Travis County Bar Association, the Austin and the National NAACP, and the Austin Area Urban League, among others. He has also received the Kelly of Alexander State President of the Year Award, the Juanita Jackson Mitchell Award for Legal Advocacy, and the Benjamin Hooks Keeper of the Flame Award and is the Houston Hall of Fame at Riverside General Hospital. Again, without further ado, allow me to, to uh, present to you uh, Dean Blasso, who will then introduce our star-studded panel of legal experts. Thank you, Dean Blasso. You may take uh, over the virtual mic. Dean, are you with us? Around they wouldn't allow me to unmute. They had to, to okay. take an action. Well, Bob, thank you so much for that really gracious introduction, and thank you so much for the great work uh, you've done in helping to prepare this conference. And as always, uh, I'm uh, really honored to be in the presence of the ambassador. Uh, ambassador Chumbote Pyle is really uh, someone who I think has really been sent to us to really help put together a movement. And I really have to acknowledge the things that she's doing that I think that maybe can bring people together uh, in uh, a way that really can, can advance justice in ways that it really hasn't been advanced in some time. So I'm really encouraged by ADDI and the things that ADDI is doing. I think this conference is timely. I, I, I know that there's so many good people around the world that are working in different ways, like Attorney Croft and and the case, which is really kind of a unique and very intriguing to me with the legal theories that they came up with in terms of your actual photography and, and owning the photography and, 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 and getting a theory to uh, maybe in some ways uh, seek to circumvent that issue of the statute of limitations. I think it's uh, really kind of a brilliant foray. I'd be very interested to see uh, what kind of decision they will ultimately come up uh, with. But I think that we know, and one of the things that I have I really, uh, really clearly observed in some of the things that maybe have brought forth uh, by Ambassador, Ambassador and in, in her book and some of the things she said about some of the similarities between Africa and um, those in the diaspora in the U.S. Or, or wherever it might be and the real similarities and the need for uh, a recompense being made uh, throughout. I want to applaud you all for how you have uh, entitled uh, this conference in terms of different forms. Not just legal regress, because uh, 
using collective buying power or whatever. I don't know, but, uh, but those things might help fuel the, the litigation because in some ways we're asking people that have benefited from the system to actually make decisions in our favor. I think that's one thing that Attorney Crump was saying about his client in reference to uh, actually talking about uh, uh, what occurred in Germany and who would actually be uh, teaching uh, history and some of the ironies if, if the old Nazis were involved in that. And I think that's a, a real parallel that we can bring, although there's so many good folks around the world of all colors that we need that. So uh, this panel is tremendous. I want to uh, 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 introduce them uh, from the outline. I think that it would be uh, extremely important for us to hear from them. Uh, the first one, uh, Damien uh, Olivetta, uh Benjamin, he is the chairman of uh, ADVI in Antigua. Uh, he's a, a human rights attorney, and, uh, and, and, and importantly, he has a lot of specializations in high-level uh, matters, uh, investments, finance, intellectual property, uh, issues that are very relevant to the discussion. Uh, and then Professor Justin Hansbrell, Hansford is, uh, has already been uh, referenced by uh, keynote speaker Benjamin Crump. Uh, but I think that uh, what we need to note, I think very importantly, is he is the executive director of the new uh, Thurgood Marshall uh, Civil Rights Institute there at uh, Howard University. Uh, and I think that's a very new institute. Uh, having someone like him to head it is going to be great. He's a full, former Fulbright scholar. And one thing that means a lot to those of us uh, civil rights lawyers around the country is that he formerly clerked for the legendary Damon Keith, uh, a United States District Judge who died recently. But uh, but I think that's truly significant that he was he was trained and nurtured by Damon Keith. He's a prolific uh, researcher and a uh, writer. Um, Anthony Morgan is the uh, next panelist. Uh, the uh, and he um, is the manager of the anti-racism. A unit for the city of uh, Toronto. You know, some cities are being more proactive than others, and so there's a whole history into the, uh, how that uh, unit was created and the scope of the unit and their work that is so relevant to this discussion. Uh, he's a true anti-racism uh, advocate, has appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Lawyer Magazine in Canada has uh, uh, has selected him as one of the 25 most influential lawyers in the whole country of Canada. So he's clearly someone that has great uh, prestige and has done much. Uh, uh, Henry Senyolu uh, is an international law expert. Uh, he's also got expertise in terms of uh, oil and gas and finance. He's done high level negotiations on a number of levels. Uh, he has negotiated uh, large bills in reference to power plants and other types of energy facilities. Uh, so in terms of uh, what's to happen and what's to be had, uh, someone with, those, uh, with that background, those kinds of negotiation skills would be very relevant. And the, uh, the final one, Professor uh, Marilyn, uh, uh, is that Sophocles, typically? Uh, she's a professor of uh, humanities, um, and uh, she is a coward. Uh, she's a founder of the uh, uh, Women Ambassadors Foundation, but in, importantly to this conversation, she's the founder of the Afro-European uh, African American uh, Transit uh, Atlantic Forum. Uh, that's to facilitate dialogue in reference to issues on both sides of the uh, Atlantic and is very much uh, relevant to the conversation that we're about to have uh, today. So uh, I would like to start out and maybe in the order that the, the names are brought forth, if that's okay uh, for everyone, I would like to start out by uh, asking each one because I think it's important for us to hear from you and not to have a lot of constraint on your thinking. I'd like to know from each one of you uh, what your uh, background brings to the discussion of how we achieve uh, 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 how we achieve reparations, um, and I think that uh, what I would like for each one of you to do is to be specific and particular, uh, 
and in the same sense define for us what you believe reparations to mean because reparations means different things to different people so we'd like to be able to get uh, your knowledge your perspective your expertise to know what you believe reparations uh, would be and what they look like and, and who they should come from so if we might start out and in the order that they were brought up start out with uh, uh, with Chairman Benjamin Chairman Benjamin available. Chairman Benjamin. Chairman Benjamin. No. Okay. Um, so, well, if not, then uh, we would go to Director Hansford to see if uh, if he's available. Uh, the next person uh, in line. So uh, we, uh, we, and, and if um, if uh, if, it, if uh, Chairman Benjamin is on the line, we can come back to to him later. <coughs> Apparently, he needs to be unmute, unmuted. Ah. Hello. That's better. Okay. We can hear you now. Oh, very good, very good. Very good. Okay, here we go. Is the, the video gone? Yes, give me your face. One second. One second. How is this possible? It's a little bit. Here we go. Can you guys see me now? Can you see no. me now? No, we could before, but can you see me now? No? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to go for my phone. It seems like my computer is different. It's a everybody. Greetings, all phone calls observed. Uh, once again, thank you to all who are here who are on this line. It's a very important meeting. And I'm, I'm once again gracious and grateful to be included in this discussion. Once again, I have to thank Ambassador for including me into this discussion. As well, I have to give a, a shout out to Benjamin Crump. Well, a very, very important case that Mr. Crump is doing and is something that would benefit all African-Americans in the United States uh, at this stage. And it's something that we can look forward to that will be landmark that will help to move our cause forward. Uh, Mr. Betso, thank you for introducing me and uh, for the good work that you, you've done. Thank you for being the chair and the moderator for this, this hosting that we're doing today. And let me jump straight into my aspect. Now, as Mr. Bledsoe said, reparations means a lot of different uh, meanings to different people. For me, it's about what you can give back. Um, being that I'm from the Caribbean, trained in the Caribbean, raised in the Caribbean, I have raised up in a country where I'm used to black rule. Yes, we might have a lot of individuals who come from overseas in Europe and the United States for foreign direct investment, but we do not look at the situation the same way how you know our African American brothers and sisters might look at themselves. We look at a situation from this point of view that we have been jettisoned on these islands in the Caribbean for over 400 years. Whereas the African American had the opportunity to go back to the United States or go further afield through slavery, most of the African, uh, most of the Caribbean um, slaves have lived the 400 years on these islands, have both fought colonization from the, the, the US, from Europe, from Spain, from the Dutch for 400 years. And today we are still self governed. So for me, Repatriation is nothing about anyone paying back into um, into our culture, into our community, into our blackness as for exploitation for slavery. The question that keeps coming up every time we look at the issue of repatriation is this. Who's going to pay the repatriation? Who are we expecting to get this money from? And my thing is simply this. History is written by those who dominate. Now, in the United States, for all 
for the African Americans, we know that how the U.S. was founded. We know at some point in the U.S. history, in the U.S. Constitution, there's a three-fifth law. We know that in 1787, they got rid of that and they brought in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to allow African Americans to have the right to vote and to be free. But this is where it goes down to. Me. You cannot be free. You cannot expect to get parity. You can't expect to get equity in a country that is not yours. How 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 do you expect, oh, we need to get paid back from the Europeans, we need to get paid back from the Americans? It was never your country in the first place. You were brought there. They have no obligation, absolutely none, to pay us. What we need to do is to actually come together as a black people and buy the black. That's our repatriation. Instead of putting that six trillion dollars of economy that we put into the U.S. economy, buying the Louis Vuittons, buying the other brands, we should invest in our own, own products, in our own products, in our own education. One of the things that we need to do in terms of repatriation to help ourselves move forward is an actual promise to ourselves of fulfilling what we need to do in terms of the brain drain. A lot of the brain drain from Africa was caused as a result of slavery. We have a lot of, of, of talented people in the diaspora, which Mother Africa needs to help. The U.S., even if we sit down in the U.S. and we try to help our brothers and sisters in the U.S., it won't be received in the same way as it would be received in Africa because we're not from the U.S. We will never own that country. We will never get that 40 acres of the mule. We will never get the repatriation in the way that is asked for. Our ancestors, I know, as a result, they demand justice. But also, in order to demand justice, justice has a certain level of prudence that individuals have to take. You have to take self-responsibility. It's one thing to say that you're, you're going to be a part of an organization to move things forward. But if you are actually not taking that responsibility, self-responsibility for yourself, what are you actively doing? Like, for example, I, I appreciate and I, I hear my, my good brother, Mr. Crump, in terms of what's being done in Harvard. For example, here in Antigua, what we have done, our history, more than any other country, is linked specifically to Harvard University. The slave owners who owned Harvard, all the money came from the sugar plantations here in Antigua. To build the university, to do that, it's still there in the annals of Harvard right now. You can go look up the history, it's there. What we have been able to achieve, we didn't go to Harvard and say, oh, your, your, your benefactors ran um, a slave plantation in Antigua, Betty's opened a few other things in Antigua, and our people were enslaved. So we want $400 million. We didn't say that. We went back and said to them, you know what? We know how linked our histories are. We know what our people have done. We know the struggles that our people have gone into. Now, we are at a stage that we want to elevate our people. We want our repatriation. But what we said to them is that we don't want money. We want you to come to Antigua, Give us a law, facility, a law faculty, which they've agreed to. They have now agreed to give us a law faculty at the fifth campus for the University of the West Indies in Antigua to train lawyers. It's a Harvard program. But that, to me, is a beneficial repatriation. That's a beneficial repatriation program. What we're doing is enhancing our people's capacity to deal with their own issues by utilizing the intelligence or, as you might say, the foundations that our ancestors already built. Because there's no way that they're going to get them to give us that money. They're not going to pay that. They're not going to pay that. They're going to look at all manners and ways of how to get around it. But as soon as we, as black people, realize that our power lies with our knowledge, once you have your knowledge, you can have economic power. And those are the two things that you need to move forward. The movement is a movement, and that will always look at the movement in terms of Black Lives Matters. Yes, they've put 
forward a lot of issues in terms of what black people are going through in the United States. But has it moved the agenda for African American, Caribbean American, black American, black forward? We have Joe Biden in, in as the president now, president elect. Has the issues of the black American, African American, Caribbean American, of Latino descent, of black descent, has anything been addressed? You will never get it addressed in a country that is not fundamentally yours. It has never been yours, will never be yours. And until we accept that Africa is where we come from and we need to make a stand, we can then go forward. You see, you look at you look at it, you see the Chinese. China's for the Chinese, the Europeans, Europe for the Europeans, the America for the Americans. Where are the blacks? The black self contributes to the entire development of the entire world that we know of right now. Everything from history, math, geography, admiralty, maritime, we have contributed so much to civilization worldwide. But look at the other races. All the other races can point to a central land of identity, a central culture of identity. What you have is blacks in Africa Blacks in America, Blacks in the Caribbean, those who have Black descent, Latinos who have some Black in them, but sometimes don't consider themselves Black. Look at Florida. We have Venezuelans and Cubanos who are meant to be us. So we can see the real-time effect of what we're talking about, right? And yes, some people might say, I don't know what I'm talking about in terms of America. I'm a born American. I was born in America. But I can speak like that, right? I was educated at Columbia University, so I can speak like that. I had my JMD from Fordham University, so I can speak like that. What I'm simply saying is I've realized as a black man that we have to have a central identity that connects all black people worldwide. We have to take pride in of what we have. We have a lot. We've given a lot. We still give a lot. And as such, I, that's what the party making means to me. We need to have a plan that we decide whether it be as a collective or individually. State your claim in the country of your origin. State your claim in your birthright. Reclaim your birthright. Once we reclaim our birthright and we start to see and support black industry, we begin to see how we can have the economic power and the unity that we need, that we can get repatriation. At the moment, we can't lobby on a lot on, on, on our international basis because we have no unity. We can't make certain things happen for the black community because we don't have any unity. But the best way for us to move forward is for us to join hands, find our common identity, and set our sights on Africa and build Africa. Have a commonality of assets. Attorney Benjamin, thank you so much. I guess we just lost you there, but but that, those are very eloquent words. You had some really insightful thoughts and uh, ideas, uh, really thinking out of the box uh, and being very uh, frank about uh, what you see. And I think those all those issues are truly worthy of discussion. Uh, now, I guess we would uh, like to ask uh, Professor Hansford, who uh, from uh, the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Institute at Howard uh, University uh, School of Law, to, uh, uh, to give us his perspectives on, uh, on the question on the table. Uh, Director Hansford. Yes, good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here, Dean Bledsoe, um, Ambassador. All right, Kana, thank you so much for this invitation. I wanted to say, first of all, um, uh, I myself am a Garveyite. I've, I've begun my career working for uh, a posthumous pardon for Marcus Garvey. My dream, I'm a born African American. My dream has always been to take the case of Black Americans before the United Nations like Garvey did. Um, at the time it was called the League of Nations, like the early part of the 20th century, um, and to argue for 
uh, a possible petition for redress for the human rights violations uh, that people of African descent have experienced around the world. Uh, but you know, being someone who's a descendant of people who were enslaved in the United States, uh, especially for me here in the United States, that was an issue. Uh, in 1947, the NAACP submitted a petition to the United Nations um, under the uh, auspices of W.B. Du Bois, and uh, he argued for redress for human rights violations that happened during the Jim Crow time period, all the way back to enslavement. Uh, that has that continued. Uh, Malcolm X famously argued for there to be an, arg an argument for not just civil rights, but for human rights for black people. And uh, what I have tried to do in my career is to continue that tradition of thinking about our issue in a human rights context, because I believe that, um, you know, I disagree with the, the previous speaker a bit. I do believe that we do have rights that demand redress. You look at other peoples around the world, uh, think about uh, Jewish people in the aftermath of the Holocaust, you think about uh, Native American people here in the United States, uh, people who have been victims of mass atrocities have been given reparation around the world historically, and even specifically here in the United States, Japanese people who were interned during World War II uh, forced to move outside of their homes as part of the war effort. They were given uh, financial reparations, I think $20,000 for each family. Uh, so reparations is a reality. Uh, they have been giving reparations and they will be giving reparations. Uh, and it's not, it's not something that's figurative. Over the last couple of years, we've had strides uh, on the university level. Georgetown University here in Washington, D.C., where I am, has been open about having a conversation, for, uh, arguing that they do owe reparations for descendants of people that they enslaved, university enslaved, uh, in order to uh, create its, its campus uh, here in Washington. And there are many university universities around the country that owe reparations to black people. There's a book called Ebony and Ivory that goes into depth in terms terms of the reparations that universities owe. We know that many companies, uh, Wells Fargo, banks, um, of course cities, so many people benefited from enslavement and also from Jim Crow segregation. They all owe reparations. So it's not just a question of petitioning governments. Uh, there is a long list of groups that are part of this conversation and they will be made to come to account. You could say that here in the United States, we're facing something like a racial reckoning after this past summer as a, as a result of the work of Black Lives Matter protesters. So in, in the question of what is Black Lives Matter as a movement obtained for Black Americans, um, you know, I don't think you can look at it as a particular organization that is going to claim a particular victory. I think reparations, this is my view, reparations always will be a local matter that will take place on the grassroots level from community to community, city to city, uh, township to township. I don't think it's going to be something that Joe Biden will give to uh, all African Americans. I think the people in the city of Evanston, Illinois, for example, who created a city council ordinance that was passed uh, about a year ago are already getting reparations. They have, the money's already getting uh, organized to give out to those people in that small town. We saw California now, Los Angeles, um, Asheville, North Carolina. You know, you see cities um, and you see groups of uh, people who on a local level try to, and not only try, but be successful in obtaining reparations around the country. So one of the things that we've been doing here in uh, at Howard University, and I'm gonna put some links in the chat for people who may, may be interested in this, we have uh, initiatives that we are creating to allow these local movements for reparations to get legal support so that we can have uh, cases that we support in Tulsa, Oklahoma, cases that we support 
in um, where my family's plantation is from, Forsyth, Georgia, where they lynched um, people, um, you know, in in uh, the 1910s and chased people out of their land and stole their land. All of these different uh, cases are ripe for support. And I think in terms of coming together as a community, we, think we need to think about coming together to support people on a local level. Uh, so one of our uh, goals with this program is to use this international human rights framework of understanding that reparations on the human rights level, when it has been obtained by people of Jewish descent, people in Chile, people in Argentina, people around the world who have received reparations, they always use this framework of receiving restitution, um, measures that restore victims to the original situation they were in before they received uh, these or suffered these gross violations of their human rights. Uh, for example, restoration of citizenship, full citizenship, restoration of their land. We want our land back, right? Rest restoration of our property, compensation in terms of money, financial compensation, rehabilitation, psychological care, uh, medical care, um, uh, freedom from mental slavery, education, satisfaction in terms of commemoration, truth-seeking panels, uh, memorials, uh, public apologies, the changing of names of institutions from the names of enslavers or Jim Crow segregationists to other names. And of course, guarantees of non-repetition, including judicial reforms, police reform, criminal justice reform, um, all of these different reforms that make sure that the continuation of slavery, that is our mass incarceration system in the United States, for example, we want to make sure that these types of harms do not continue. I'm also part of something called the National African American Reparations Commission, um, led by Dr. Ron, Ron Daniels, who, who, along with many other longtime uh, reparations advocates, you know, dedicated to the memory of Queen Mother Moore and uh, so many people who have been doing this work for many years. I know Cobra has been mentioned in the past. Uh, we also are in trying to ensure that as these small reparations programs continue to uh, become a reality on a local level, we want to ensure that they don't get hijacked by people who really don't, who do not know what they're talking about. And instead, we know that reparations needs to be led by the people, the people who were most directly impacted by the legacies of Jim Crow, of enslavement and police violence here in the United States today should be the ones to determine what reparations means. Uh, so, uh, so with Dr. Ron Daniels leading the way, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can be part of that solution. The last thing I'm going to mention here, and I'm going to add some more links, um, along with people at the United Nations, um, the Special Rapporteur on Racism, and also uh, with Act, uh, activists in the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, we are calling for reparations for police violence against Black people here in the United States today. Uh, the reparations movement historically has been very deeply focused on the legacy of slavery because of the great atrocity it, it is and will always be. But the problem is that, uh, that as Attorney Crump so articulately described, there are often questions about statutes of limitations. There are questions about uh, determining uh, liability and are those people still alive, yada, yada. There are always these excuses. But the reality is we need reparations for things that are happening right now. I had the opportunity with um, Attorney Crump alongside Attorney Crump to go to the UN with the family of Mike Brown here in Ferguson at the launch of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement coming out of Ferguson, St. Louis in 2014. The uh, Eric Garner family, the George Floyd family, the Sandra Bland family, the Tamir Rice family, um, Breonna Taylor family, they also are people who have been victimized by a racist government, a racist state, the family members were taken from, away from them. They have been devastated psychologically. Medical studies have, have even shown 
that black communities have faced widespread mental health effects as a result of the terror that the terrorism of police violence has inflicted on black Americans in the United States, so much so uh, that we have collectively um, had tangible health effects, increased instances of diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, all these harms can be traced to the effects of being inflicted with the terror of police violence, which has matched the terror of lynching and the terror of uh, all of these legacies of enslavement. And so we need recompense for that too. We don't have to go back 150 or 200 years to find grounds for human rights violations as a people. We have grounds that we can use right now and you don't have to worry about statutes of limitations for those grounds. So if, you, if we take a really clear look at what we're facing for black people, we have rights to self-determination, we have rights to freedom, we have rights to live out our own um, independent vision of what we want for ourselves and our people. And these rights are being interfered with and we demand justice and we are going to have justice we already are getting justice. As I said, reparations is already happening. It's just a question of um, how it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen not just on the federal level, not from the, the president's office. Joe Biden is not going to sign a paper. What's going to happen is local universities, banks, companies, cities, towns, and even families. I have, so again, like I said, I'm a descendant of people who were enslaved in Forsyth, Georgia. And um, it's a long story, but I went on online and typed in my last name in Forsyth, Georgia. And I ended up finding on Facebook uh, the descendants of the people who were likely those who enslaved my family members. And I went back and forth in my mind as to what I should do. Of course, I had different emotions about it. But then I realized, you know, I have a family that needs money for scholarships for, our, for our, our smaller children. I have a family that is in need today. And there's, with technology being the way it is, why can't I just go to that family, knock on their door, and start asking for them to contribute to our family scholarship fund? So we can go to, so we can start making these asks on the governmental level, on the corporate level, on the university level. But I'm down to start making those asks on the family level um, and, and you know, directly using technology that we have never had in our access in our hands in the past to start making our claims for what what is ours. I believe that it's a movement that our ancestors are eager for us to pursue. I believe that we owe it to them, we owe it to ourselves, and I think nothing will make our ancestors more happy than for us to get what we are rightly owed. And so I'm really excited to be part of this movement of people who are standing up for our communities. And I'm eager to work with you all to make that a reality. Yeah, so thank you so much. You guys are doing great, uh, great work there. And I really appreciate your insights. Uh, and I think even uh, the, the little bit of a disagreement we have on whether or not it's uh, appropriate to think that we can change things in the U.S. is really worthy of discussion. So it's good that we've got that dialogue going, but you guys are doing some tremendous things. So that's that's really good to, to know, and, and I think the direction that you provided is, is great. Um, uh, let's, let's move on through with the uh, other panelists, and uh, Attorney Anthony Morgan would be the, uh, the next one, um, and so we would like uh, Attorney Morgan. All right, can I, am I being heard okay? I can hear you well. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, first off, I want to say tremendous thanks. I am incredibly humbled and honored to be a part of this uh, global conversation on the way of African descent across the world. So I thank uh, Ambassador uh, Kual, uh, also Attorney LeBlanc, uh, and of course the delivering message now. Um, to the ambassador delivered, followed by uh, the, the message from Attorney well, I am also feeling renewed and re-energized on the question of what does reparations look like for our community. So to speak to the, the, the very direct question, what does it look like? The the anchoring of my of my thinking, the infrastructure in fact, is 
looking as, uh, as Dr. Hatcher just mentioned, looking at international rights law, really and truly, I believe that a lot of the framework that we can use to advance the over justice claims for people of African descent is, is there. Not to say it's complete, but when we look at the international decade for people of African descent that the United Nations has declared from the year 2015 to 2024, and specifically looking to the international decade and identify the program of activities that the United Nations has developed, and I should say the United Nations didn't develop, in, in, develop this framework in isolation of black communities. Black organizers, advocates, professors, lawyers from across the world help influence the development of the program of activities that offer a groundwork and framing for, uh, for global justice for uh, black people across the world. And so I strongly believe that when it comes to reparations, what it looks like is a restoration of conditions for allowing black self-determination. And as as you mentioned, and part of what that looks like is diversity for different black communities, but ultimately, how do we restore the conditions for well-being for black folks is the critical question. And providing a human rights framework and transferring resources to black communities or outright uh, allowing black communities to develop those resources uh, in a way that makes sense for them and their well-being and, and future generations for us and our work in future generations is incredibly key. And so when we're thinking about this question, I think it's, it's really important for us not to waste time uh, looking around because as other folks have mentioned, there is a lot of important work that's being done. And I do think the program of activities from the United Nations International Decade for people of African descent offers that. It offers a framework for change when it comes to the areas of education, employment, housing, care, arts, and education, including the justice system, the child welfare system. A lot of the issues that are pressing and important for people of African descent where we experience alarming rates of disadvantage and discrimination are articulated in that program of activity. And the United Nations Working Group of Experts with People of African Descent has done several country visits, um, uh, one of them being the United States, but also in Canada. And while I'm really thrilled to be a part of this conversation, is that uh, when it comes to conversations around people of African descent, rarely is Canada considered. Uh, Canada is often, although it, it, it shares the freshest border with, with the United States, and despite the fact that we, as a, as a country, uh, collectively have played a, a significant role in the development of the experience and suffered considerable injustices that are related to the transatlantic slave trade, rarely do people ever think about blackness and Canada in the same sentence. Often it is to suggest that black people are not in Canada. The, of course, major caveat that is uh, partially a joke with Drake and then the Toronto Raptors, but beyond that, rarely do people think about blackness on uh, people of African descent here on these lands now called Canada. Of course, the original lands are referred to as Turtle Island by indigenous people. Uh, and I think it's really important to mention that because it, it creates a more full picture of what uh, of what the more important work is making sure that they spent in the, the, the experience and the, the diverse experiences of, of enslavement followed by segregation, marginalization, lynching, and disenfranchisement more, more generally. Really, do we think about the Canadian uh, parts, the Canadian parts of that story? But when it comes to Canada, what folks should really know and understand and why the question of reparations remains really important for people's access to defense. Uh, within Canada, and for some context, black people make up some 3.5 percent of Canada's overall population. Admittedly, not as as large as the representation should be, some 13 percent of the in the United States. Uh, it's more the significance that black people have had. The traffic and trade of people of African descent has exist, existed on land now claimed by Canada since approximately 1528 to the year 1834. So for more than two centuries, black people to the traffic into the land that are now claimed by Canada. For some added context, the country of Canada only formally came into existence in 1867. So from 1867 to 20, 
country that is 163 years. Why I point that out is to note that the institution of slavery existed on these lands now claimed by Canada for longer than the state of Canada has existed on these lands. And yet still there is this collective erasure of black people and their contributions and experiences. And so when it comes to the disparities that black people very much experience here in Canada, so again, disproportionate outcomes in education, employment, housing, healthcare, child welfare systems, policing and the justice system, there are a range of fundamental and deep injustice in these states. But because Canada has been so effective in projecting itself into the world as this state agent, uh, because of the histories of, of the uh, of course, the Underground Railroad, Canada is seized on that to erase the experiences of black people and also, I think, undermine the global and collective claims of people of African descent because it makes it much harder for people of African descent in this part of the world to be able to make uh, the claims in unison with our brothers and sisters uh, and folks across the uh, global African diaspora to say that we are just entitled being a part of this conversation and seeing recompense for our folks. Because, of course, this is not just about those, those more than two century, that more than two century long period of the insignia of people of African descent, but it is also very much about uh, what, of course, uh, African American professor Sidia Hartman refers to the afterlife of slavery. So, series of, of institutions, practices, habits, behaviors that led to skewed like chances for black people in the areas of, of education, knowing that our black, our black communities are, are, are regularly disenfranchised as you know, it comes to participating in the vote, but access to housing, to uh, good, clean, sustainable jobs, equitable education, uh, fairness, uh, equitable policing, you name it, across the board when it comes to people of African descent in this part of the world, uh, in Canada, we experience enormous uh, disproportionate realities in that, in that respect. And so for the work that I've been fortunate to do as a, as a human rights lawyer, and although I'm not representing the city of Toronto, I, I should know from the that I do work for the city of Toronto, for the city of Toronto is that confronting anti-black racism unit. Part of our aim, uh, even if not explicit, is to help support the collective understanding and development of a consciousness of an expanded way of considering reparations. And so it is, again, fundamentally rooted in supporting self-determination of black communities, but more so through creating the conditions for black people to decide their own realities. So making sure that we have those fundamentals in place and shifting and redirecting resources. And in Toronto, of course, the, the conversation has, uh, we're on base now in Toronto, the, the conversation has uh, of defund, defunding the police has also seized many members of the public. And many folks are using that as a framework to think about, well, what, what would we do with those resources? When we think about the harms that have been visited upon people of African descent, not just from slavery, but what has also followed that period uh, here in Canada, uh, but we know that black people need access to food, to housing, to shelter, uh, to good jobs, and uh, uh, more fairness and equity in policing. And so, Again, we also have started to, as a country, look to the United Nations International Decade for People's Actors in the Sense. Canada, as a country, for all its fault, to take few nations across the world that have officially recognized the International Decade for People's Actors in the Sense. The province of Ontario, which also uh, houses uh, the, or the, the broader jurisdiction uh, for the, the city of Toronto, has also officially recognized the International Decade. And this city itself, the city of Toronto, is officially recognized in the international decade. All of this creates, I think, a, a an appropriate structure for us to be thinking about how do we move these global, these global claims for justice for our people in a way that is rooted in a lot of the work, resistance, advocacy that has led to the ultimate framework that we now see within the, within the international human rights system. But I also want to be clear and say I don't think the international human rights system is going to save us. That's not what I want to be understood to be saying. What I do want to be understood to be saying is that, again, we have a framework. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. We are also actively in the international decade for people of African descent. And it offers a global rallying call, a space for us to organize around, not just for the years 2015 
2024, but well beyond. If folks were to, to look online, to look at what has been developed because of the international decades, people back to in Japan. In terms of its documentation, its evidence, the country report, we will all get a sense of how to think about reparations in a, a global perspective, but also in a very localized way that can be very helpful for moving forward our claims of justice. While I haven't studied the, the uh, uh, Care Commission's Commission uh, initiative, of course I'm familiar with it and I'm aware of how it's before, I also suggest that there is another place that we could go to to think about these questions of reparations more generally. I am of the view that, uh, again, going back to the very specific question, that reparations can very much include uh, a, a direct check, money amounts paid to black families, and see why it can, because that's that direct transfer of funds happens to the extraction of black life and labor, uh, and so I don't see why it can't flow, flow the other way, but it also should uh, include uh, the creation of institutions, uh, the a school, a hospital services, so that black people can have control over their lives, because largely that's what was stolen from us. We can look at the diversity of ranges, the range of experiences that black people have had across the global African diaspora, from uh, the Americas, to, to Europe, to the continent itself, uh, to Oceania. Uh, but what, one thing that remains consistent despite those diversities is the, the, the stealing of our, of our land, uh, labor, and lives. And so how do we recreate the conditions that would allow us to have a sense of dignity, humanity, wellness, and equity is what's key in so my work here is largely focused on trying to support conversation and provide some intellectual groundwork and some legal groundwork for that. Um, and I'll end on this. One of the ways in which I've offered that most explicitly is in an article, uh, which is very obviously uh, titled, uh, What's Wrong with the Check? Where I make the argument that uh, Canada is very much implicated in the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and so, and it benefited handsomely uh, many of the early legislators, the people who are making the laws to develop this colonial space, were stakeholders of parts of families of stakeholders in many major Canadian companies and also a couple of universities that continue to exist benefited considerably from, uh, and very directly from the trying to find this slave trade. So I'll leave my comments there. I'm looking forward to being a part of this conversation, not just for now, uh, but uh, for the ongoing uh, years ahead of the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a really, really uh, insightful. And I have to thank ADDI again because putting such a great assortment of people from around the world together, we can see the value of the of the reach of an organization that seeks to join people globally. Uh, Attorney Sonia Olu uh, would be the uh, the next presenter. So, Attorney Sonia Olu. Are we there? Can you hear me? Ah, we can now. We can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, good, good evening, um, everyone. Uh, may I uh, start by um, sitting on existing protocols? Um, my name is Henry Sanyoli. I'm speaking from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's a privilege to be um, speaking to this group of great people that have done a lot of great work. Um, thank you, DDI. Um, at some point, I was trying to like crack my head uh, when I looked through the bio of most people that most of the panelists and people that have spoken earlier, and I tried to find um, where where I fit in because I'm mainly an energy lawyer, but um, I, I I know how to 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 look at where the numbers are. You know, so I, I probably will bring bring my experience from that that point of view. So so clearly, um, reparation for me um, speaks to three things, and it's uh, recompense, compensation, restitution, um, and a, a host of other things that that tends to bring someone who has suffered injury um, and some form of um, you know, recompense um, and putting them back in the position they would have been if they had not suffered that injury. 
Now, clearly, from from all the speakers, uh, it is clear that we have um, we have to look at this 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 topic from three different eyes, and uh, and I will explain this from Anthony Benjamin's um, um, a, a earlier focus. You could tell that there is actually a a, a direction and a position for. Um, a view at which someone from the from the Caribbean region looks at what reparation is. Same thing with 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 the previous speak, the previous two speakers, and that's from the American point of view and the Canadian point of view. So, I'll, I'll let me let me speak from the African point of view since since that's 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 what I I, I represent now. Has, has injury been um, been suffered? Clearly, yes. And from the African point of view, it's basically true theft of artwork, continuous theft of raw materials, and theft of um, of of, um, of what you call um, the book, the yeah, property, which which includes you know the, the people, um, brain drain, um, name it. Because um, if you look at the way this, 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 the slave masters pick slaves, I think people were, you know, people are of the false view that, you know, it was really the um, the weaker Africans that were picked up as slaves, and that wasn't correct. That's that's so it's it's, it's so wrong, you know. They they picked people based on um, commerciality, you know, um, so it had to be the big strong strong guys the, the 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 intelligent intellectuals you know um basically they picked basically the best 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 from the bunch basically and from a point of view africa as a block has missed out you know uh, so when you look when 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 you, when you when you look at it from that point of view um africa is where it is right now um, underdeveloped, um, in serious debts. Most African nations are in debts, you know, in 80, 80, 90, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, which they can never pay because they don't earn enough to, to be able to pay, you know. So, so, so for me, uh, reparation is about, is about a number. Um, we know who the beneficiaries of of slave trader, it's 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 simple to do that work and trace which countries benefited from it. It's 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 also I mean with technology now and 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 and, and, and accounting principles, um, there's a way to calculate and put a number to that. And um, so I, I differ a bit from where um, you know so one or two of the speakers had said. Um, you can you can't write a check and, and and have a number. You you can have a number, and once we have that number, it's now be also on us to to know to speak as one voice and um, determine how we intend to um, intend to disseminate disseminate the um, um, the the funds from that number. So, is it for you know? direct dissidents of slaves living in the U.S. and the Caribbean, can they get checks? Yes, they can get checks. Can you build institutions that would um, serve them? Yes, you can do that as for part of that check. Um, can you set up scholarships around universities? Yes, we can do that. And then we can now disseminate the rest to Africa. And it won't, it, for Africa, it would not be, you know, giving us a check, but it would be in, in, in the form of debt forgiveness, you know, to try and ensure that, you know, we we, we, we can compete with the rest of, of, of the developed world. And, um, you know, and also it's about bringing diaspora back home because most, practically everyone in diaspora, you know, you have the best of the best there. You have, you know, doctors, teachers, lawyers, 
accountants. You know, you have, you have, you have, you have, you have the best of the best there. And Africa needs, Africa is in diaspora, as in we seriously need them back home, you know. So, so for me, it's about coming, coming together under one voice. We will be slightly ignorant if we think uh, different groups fighting for different, um, um, you know, different solutions would um, uh, would gain, gain traction. It will be difficult because even the 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 master, as I call them, would, 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 their defense will be, you know, who do I talk to? I mean, who am I? Who am I listening to? I I think from a solution point of view. Um, would be for everyone to come under the umbrella of the African Union because the African Union seems to be the strongest collective voice right now um, that can speak to the UN. And for us, it's clear there's been precedents over the time. There's been precedents after the world wars where reparation has been given to uh, member countries of the Allied Forces, which is clear. The reparation has been given in both cash and even I think if it was France that was paid in livestock, you know, so there's precedence on 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 payment of reparation. I think that's clear. It's how do we come together as one voice to seek for that uh, solution and ask them to cut us a check. I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll sit back for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is really uh, important, and I guess it's great to hear from someone with uh, the litigation experience, and it obviously makes me um, uh, have some level of comfort with the ease you say you can track the, uh, the beneficiaries. So I think those are all great things, uh, among the many other comments to add to the discussion. Um, the, uh, the final uh, individual that uh, uh, we'll present here is Professor Maryland. Uh, um, the uh, And again, she is the founder of the Afro-European African-American uh, Transatlantic Forum. And so obviously it has a, a great deal to bring to this um, conversation. Uh, with that, let me just uh, ask uh, the professor uh, if uh, you would now present so we can end up this portion. I think we have uh, on the agenda to a lot of questions from the audience, but I think that we've probably run over time. So I think this would probably end up uh, the session, and then Mr. Uh, LeBlanc would come and I think uh, summarize and finalize. Okay. Professor? Well, thank you, Ambassador Tiambui Kwa, for inviting me to this uh, very August uh, group. And I thank you also for the work that you have been doing. I mean, this is the first time in the history of the African Union that uh, one ambassador brings together Thank you so much for your Thank you. Uh, reparations should or but I uh, 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 I mean that could be really uh, uh, compensation it's about restitution, and it's about the restitution of human dignity in general. I'm the only one, the odd man out, because of the odd woman out, because I'm not uh, a, 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 a person who teaches humanities and languages. Uh, but uh, and much, much of what I wanted to say has been said already, but I would add even more. I think that. The reparation should be in the framework of each of the parties agreed. In other words, if, you, if your family hails from the United States, your uh, reparation should come from the, the United States institution, whether it's the government, the bank, the 
city, a state, and so on. The resolution should have a number, and that number should be uh, held up high to the entire world community. Uh, some experts have calculated the reparations on the basis of reparations, uh, reparations for African Americans on the basis of reparations uh, that were awarded to uh, uh, families uh, after uh, had to go through during the Second World War from 1942 until 1945, and that number was 20,000. If we were to multiply that number by the number of years that African Americans have been enslaved in uh, the Americas, uh, if, if we should take that as a, a, a point of departure, it would amount to of 20 trillion. And 20 trillion is not uh, a, a number that is uh, completely out of the that is out of the ballpark, or the number that is related, it could be based on a number that uh, already exists. Uh, uh, I will uh, say, paying reparations is not a luxury for a country. It's not about whether the country wants it or not. It's about restoring the society. It's about making the society whole. And in order to do so, we have to not only uh, hold up that number of 20 trillion or more could be lost, it's about also educating, it's about informing uh, the public. Very often the public is not very informed about, uh, it's about slavery. Very often the public thinks that uh, slavery is something that happened a long time ago and that has absolutely nothing to do with the present. Uh, slavery has every bit uh, to do with the present. Uh, the, the conditions in the, in, in the schools, the conditions in the prisons, the conditions of housing, the conditions of, uh, of uh, employment, all of these have to do with slavery. And uh, when we look at, for example, the uh, African Americans are, are uh, in prison. I mean, one out of every five percent of the entire world that is incarcerated, of the entire incarcerated population in the world, comes from the United States. The United States is the number one in terms of incarceration of the. Uh, uh, of, of, of uh, black people, of people in general, but of black people in particular, and that particular uh, uh, that particular state of affairs goes way back to slavery. Uh, right after slavery, there was a system called the convict leasing system, and the convict leasing system uh, entailed uh, leasing a convict in order to do the work. Uh, and all kinds of trumped up charges were fabricated in order to enslave people. So uh, that was after slavery was abolished. And then the, the, the system, the incarceration system that we have today in the United States is a direct descendant of the uh, convict leasing system. Now, uh, I come from uh, Martinique. Uh, so, obviously, my reparation would come from, from France, uh, which is my religion and island that still is part of the French system. But I would say that in, in, the, in America in general, when you look at the history of blacks in the America, when you look at the uh, history of blacks in the Americas in general, uh, you look at a history of extreme pain, of extreme pain. And that pain that has existed for many centuries, it should be taught in school. It should not be a choice of whether someone wants to teach it or has the capacity to teach it. All schools should teach what has happened to uh, African Americans or Africans in the Americas whether they are in uh, uh, Argentina, in the United States, in Colombia, uh, in Venezuela, in, uh, in, in Martinique, Guadeloupe, Jamaica. That history should be taught. 
very often people misconstrue uh, uh, slavery for some type of the slight uh, forced labor. There was a, 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 a what happens in the often this plantation should be revealed to the public. Besides the labor, besides the indignity, besides the uh, uh, the fact of property, besides the stealing of people's names, of people's cultures, and so forth, there were also uh, scientific experiments that were conducted. There is a book, a very interesting book, of 522 pages, uh, written by uh, Harriet Washington. Medical Apartheid is the title of that book. And uh, in that book, there, there, uh, there is a uh, history of all the medical experiments that were done onto black bodies uh, during slavery and after slavery in the United States of America and beyond. And these include uh, operating on people without anesthesia, dismembering people. I mean, there is a whole, the, the, the atrocities that were committed uh, on black bodies have not been revealed to the larger public. I'm talking about this book because it, it's still in the framework of the academia, of the few who know about it. But it should be a book that should be in the hands of everyone. Uh, regarding other countries in the Americas, I would say this, that each country we are right now, uh, right at the middle point of the decade of people of African descent. We are in, in 2020, and the decade started in uh, 2015, and so this is the Time, rather than in how it city, uh, to really push for, for uh, not only for um, to, to push for reparation, of course, but to push for a huge campaign of information of, uh, on what exactly uh, slavery meant, on what slavery meant for uh, for people who uh, went through it, and also on the, the aftermath of, uh, of slavery. So to me, the issue of reparations, the shape it should take, it should take the shape of, of course, a check. The, 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 uh, the Japanese Americans began to really uh, uh, recapture their dignity, if you will, once that check of 20,000 was sent to them. So it, was a, it was a signal, a very strong signal uh, in 1988, when uh, President Reagan signed that civil liberty uh, act, it was a serious uh, signal that finally the U.S. was taking into account the pain of the community. Well, the, the pain of the African Americans is ten times, um, I shouldn't say ten times, but thousand times oh, okay. more uh, uh, egregious and should be, uh, should be presented to the entire world. Uh, each country should look at what has been done unto its citizens, uh, specifically the African American, the, uh, the descendants of uh, enslaved people, uh, in the context of their history. Uh, when we look, for example, at a country like Argentina, Argentina decimated the uh, black population. The, popu the black population of enslaved uh, people was uh, approximately 50% uh, of the Argentinian uh, population back in the mid-1800s. After President Sarmiento sent the black population on a, a, a totally foolish war with Peru, the black population uh, over the years in uh, Argentina dwindled to 4%. And you can see it when you see the football team of Argentina compared to that of Brazil. Some countries, uh, uh, like Brazil, for example, Brazil has a, a history that is akin to that of the United States, where 
uh, uh, where the population, the black population, was so um, uh, it is still extremely aggrieved uh, through police brutality. I mean, the, the, each country has to come to a reckoning with history, and uh, uh, seeking a specific amount is not. Uh, 
the consequence of the slavery. So even in the way we speak, in the proverbs, in the way we uh, look at our hair, for example, in the way we uh, um, in the way we interact with one another, in uh, in the racism that we experience, but also in the colorism that exists in many societies that, that rips apart some societies. I think that we should definitely uh, uh, look at uh, reparations from all these angles. And they should take it be in the shape of a check, but it should take the shape of, it should, uh, reparations should take the, the shape of education. It should take the shape of also making people whole, uh, physically, uh, mentally. It should also <clears throat> take the shape of uh, doing our reckoning with the banks, for example, that do not uh, tend to uh, avoid uh, lending money to us. It should take place also uh, in the shape of, uh, uh, as I mentioned, education. So there is a whole list, a laundry list that, that exists that we should uh, look at. And all the, 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 the minds that have been working on these issues, plus the, the new ones, uh, should bring their thinking caps together, and we should uh, be able to table and to present to the world some very tangible, um, and some very tangible uh, 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 tasks that uh, need to be worked uh, worked on. Some very tangible uh, laws. Uh, again, I'm not a legal mind, but uh, I uh, think that uh, if what this particular panel has uh, demonstrated is that it is certainly up to the task. Thank you. Yes, so thank you so much for that eloquent presentation. It is really uh, so uh, so insightful on so many levels. We've obviously done so much thinking about it, and and then gives us a lot of direction. Um, I want to turn it back uh, over to Attorney uh, LeBlanc. Let me just say that I kind of wanted to go through and, and just briefly uh, summarize uh, maybe some of the main topics and who commented on some of the main topics if we want to go back and, and, and look at this for information purposes. But one of the things was uh, how to educate the, the world, uh, the public about uh, what we're seeking to accomplish. I know uh, uh, both Attorney Morgan and Professor Sifokli, uh discussed that, um, uh, how to actually structure uh, a remedy. Uh, we, we know that, uh, and then the structure and organization to, 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 to go after what we're talking about. Uh, I think that uh, Hansford, Professor Hansford talked about that. How to identify responsible parties. Uh, we know that uh, Attorney Sonia Olo uh, discussed that. We know by money as a remedy uh, that uh, we know that uh, Director Hanford, uh, uh, Professor Sifokli, uh both uh, discussed that. We talked about uh, other things besides that. We know that Attorney Benjamin, uh, Professor Hansford, and Professor so folk, we all discussed that. We talk about finding out uh, what we might want to do uh, where we're actually fighting the battle. And we know that uh, Attorney Morgan and, and Director Hansford talked about that and gave us areas to go and find information about what's occurring. And we know we, we need to have the overarching me a message. And uh, the ambassador and, and Attorney Crump both uh, gave us that and, and all of them gave us some area of, of education to go and seek. So I think it's been a great, had more questions, but as you know, they had much to say. Uh, and I think to cap off uh, this discussion, uh, we'll turn it back to uh, someone that I think has done such a great work in organ helping to organize this panel, uh, that's Attorney LeBlanc. Thank you so much, um, Attorney Blesso. Uh, we are so fortunate to have been able to uh, book you <laughs> uh, to serve as the moderator for this for this panel discussion. Uh, and we also know that your schedule is incredibly busy, but yet you found time to be a part of this. So again, thank you so much. And we will certainly be in touch with you uh, for future conversations and obviously more work that the ADVF will be doing 
to push this forward beyond just a conversation because I think we've been having the conversations for quite some time now. So it's time to actually um, file the legal briefs where necessary, which is why we are gathering all of these experts, um, legal experts who have worked around the issue of reparations um, to kind of like help guide us on how to do this. I mean, and here at the ADDI, we don't have all of the answers, right? So it requires for us to work with people like yourself. And obviously, the amazing panel um, you know, from, from Canada, um, and Amy and um, Benjamin, who leads um, uh, the legal section here at ADDI, um, and, and, and so forth, and the professor, she was, she was phenomenal, um, and, and so on. And, and also, um, before we, we close out, um, thank you to the, to the distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your efforts. You will be hearing from us um, with follow-up um, requests um, for you to join our working group as we had as we have indicated in the letters that were sent to you um, weeks ago. So again, thank you so much, and we wish you much luck. Uh, but uh, before we close out, I would like to say thank you so much to the to, to the ADBI core team.
regardless of where you were born, you are an African. That alone, that simple act of accepting the fact that we are African is the beginning of the healing that we desire. Where are we going from here? I personally, for example, I understand that there were some atrocities committed in South America, but I don't know a lot about it. There were atrocities committed in the Caribbean. I don't know a lot about them. I know about atrocities committed in the United States, but I don't have as much, a lot of personal experience and understanding. Brown, I know some, something, but I do know a lot about what happened in Africa. I don't know about what happened in Europe. What I'm saying is, as we go through this process, because ultimately we are looking at coming up with a document that's going to look at reparations for all black people around the globe. A document that's going to meet the needs of all black people around the globe. So for us to be able to come up with such a document, we must take our case to the people. So what we have in plan, while the legal teams are going to work on creating this document, we're also going to have a parallel conversation where we are going to be educating our people about the need for reparations, about what this means to you, about translating the, the conversation about slavery, that people must understand that slavery has never ended, that it has just taken a different shape, but we are still enslaved people. Somebody put in there that uh, we are suffering from post-traumatic leg syndrome. I would also like to have another acronym, Continuous Traumatic Stress Disorder. Continuous Traumatic Stress Disorder. That is what we are suffering from as black people. No matter where you find us, we are suffering from continuous traumatic stress disorder. Our trauma has never ended. So our next event, which will be in 30 days, we are going to be talking about and highlighting the atrocities that were admitted to black people in South America. Because most people don't know that. So Atari LeBlanc is going to be looking at, at the speakers, gurus on subject matters, and we're going to highlight the atrocities that were committed to black people in South America. And the next session will be about what happened in the Caribbean, and what happened in the United States, what happened in Europe, what, what's happening in Africa, and what happened in the Asian countries. Our people simply do not know. So as part of ADPI, our job is to educate. As we take our case and issue for reparations to the world, it's not just black people who need to know. Even the white people do not know what their governments have done in the past. Mm -hmm. I gave a lecture at George Washington University uh, sometime in 18 months. And when I was there, one of the students was a, friend, a young French guy. He said, Ambassador, what you have told us today, I've never heard of. He says, I'm a Frenchman. I grew up being told the reason the French were going to Africa is to symbolize the Africans. What you have told us, I have never heard. The truth of the matter is, even the citizens of those countries who were the biggest perpetrators of the biggest violations, the worst violations against humanity, their citizens do not know what their governments have done and what their governments continue to do. So the education that we're talking about is for everyone who cares about humanity. It's for everyone on earth who believes in a just, fair, and righteous world. People must know what is right is right. What is wrong is wrong. Black people around the world have been harmed. There is no disagreement. But let's take our message to the people on earth. So in 30 days, we shall be reaching back to all of you. Our next conversation is going to be educating the world about atrocities that were meted, meted to black people in South America. Next one will be the Caribbean, then the United States, then Europe, and we will end up with Africa, and then Asia, and we will end up
work with Africa. But not only are we going to talk about what is happening at every level as we talk about what was needed to those black people in that part of the world, we're also going to take it forward and say, has this ended or is it still continuing? Then we're going to pause back to the world and say, you cannot talk about the righteous world when all these atrocities are being committed in broad day life and you are giving it a blind eye. We are challenging the world to do the right thing by black people. We are bringing out what
You really don't know I'm a Christmas scientist. Yeah, life children, yeah. All around Reaching out to life children. Yeah. My baby and life children live right. Don't fight, don't fight. Oh no, no, baby, you're not.